Welcome to the Annie Tunes In podcast. How did you get started in the fitness industry? Tell me a little bit about that. I was, uh, well, fitness itself. Uh, my mom was a big workout person, a uh, huge influence on my life. She battled her weight even when she clearly didn't need to, but in her mind, you know, that's when you, I think when you start that way at a certain age, you kind of always go through that. Um, my wife may be the only woman I know who doesn't battle her weight, doesn't think about her weight, doesn't think, do I look good? Doesn't look at parts of her body like that. She just gets dressed and she is who he is, who she is. So, so honestly, um, she's, she's probably freer in a lot of ways than people like me. I was a fat kid. My mom had me in Weight Watchers when I was 10 years old. So in my mind, that's always a thing. I guess I'm kind of always a fat kid, even if I'm not fat. So that's that. In terms of training people in fitness that way, I was, um, I was leaving a gym one day and my morning workout partner, training partner had not shown up that day. And uh, a guy asked me if he could train with me. And uh, I kind of looked him up and down, like to see, could this guy, you know, like, are we similar in strengths? And, you know, could he hang? Could I hang kind of thing? And I said, yeah, but I go early in the morning. And he said, yeah, no problem. Where do you charge? And uh, I went, uh, let me get back to killing that. And it just, it became, it became, I never looked back. I mean, I, I did it. I worked with him. I worked with a buddy of his. And then a woman um, asked me to do it. And I said, I can only do afternoons. So I did like late afternoon after work. And I, after a couple of weeks, I realized I was a having more fun for sure, but making more money training three people three times a week than I was at a, at a job at a, or what, you know, what, what would then be considered a real job as my dad would have called it. Uh, and I, I quit the job. So what was your job? What were you doing? I was an assistant in a management, a talent management agency. Got it. Okay. So how old were you at this point? 28, 28. So you had been working for, did you graduate 29. college? Okay, so yeah, you graduated yeah. college, you yeah, went into I work. Graduate college. Yeah, I went to Duke. Come there on. There you now. go. Hey, hey, right, so step you, up. Do you're smart little. over there. Okay. Uh, in your words, my thoughts. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So so I did it. So you know, I probably, I mean, when I say I quit the job and did it like full time, I wasn't full time. I was doing a few hours here, a few hours there, and I was blown away at how much free time I had. I wasn't a, a nine to five person. Um, that was my alarm, by the way, to make sure had we not connected uh Perfect. so so um i was blown away by how much free time i had right and and uh, you know free time uh what is it uh, idle hands of the devil's workshop mm -hmm. it wasn't that way i was just more and more into fitness because my thought was what can i do now to make sure that the people who are paying me are getting everything they're expecting it more and i was i mean also i was winging it because i certainly was a workout guy and, and knew how to piece together a workout for myself and I had written workouts for friends and for family for years leading up to that but this is different when it's you know it's like you're a great cook and all of a sudden you're cooking and you're charging people money for it and, and you're in a restaurant and now you own a restaurant and it, it, that's a whole another level of pressure self-imposed or not and uh, so I was deeper and deeper and deeper into it and then I thought wow if I'm going to get serious about this I have to really get serious. And I started chasing down certifications and workshops and clinics and seminars and anything I could find or fly to. And, and I, I immersed myself, but I've always been on the full immersion guy, right? Like if I'm going to, if I'm going to take up tennis, I'm going to buy a racket balls, ball machine, three full outfits. I'm going to hire a guy. I'm going to, I mean, that's just going to be, I'm going all in. So did you look the part? Is that why this guy came up to you? Were you jacked muscle dude or were you just kind of? No, I, I mean, I think, look, I, I had worked out consistently for 10 years by then. Mm -hmm. um, and after college, I got my nutrition became, I don't want to say my nutrition was on point because it wasn't, but it was definitely, I was making way better nutritional choices, certainly Monday through Friday. Um and, and after college, alcohol was not a, a like in college, I, I, you know, I did what college students do in terms of drinking and stuff. And um, I didn't do that afterwards because it was hard to, to answer the bell. I worked out, like I said, before work. So if I'm up at 5, 5.15 back then before I was training people, 
and then I'm going to a nine to five or nine to six job, mm. that's, you know, that it's tough to drink and, and meet, you know, meet the bell every day, answer that bell. That's tough. 100%. So I was, I, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know if I looked the part, I certainly looked fit. Yeah, okay. I would say. Yeah. All right. So you went from training a couple of guys for fun, just getting started out to celebrities like Tom Brady, Kardashians, a bunch of others. So how did that come about? Was it kind of like connections being in the right spot or were you just the best of the best at that time? No chance. You're never the best of the best. Okay. Even I like that. People, even when people tell you you are, or you think you are, you're not, you're just not. And even if you are, it's fleeting. You are for that, I don't know, nanosecond. And then you're not, you're just, so um, I think that's, yeah, there's so many ways. How do you, you, you talk about reading the tea leaves here? How did it happen? Why? I don't know. I, first of all, I was in the right place. There are the, the people in that celebrity demographic, whether it's a high profile athlete or, you know, stars of, of uh, silver screen or TV or whatever. I'm, I'm in a very concentrated area. Um, and uh, I was, trying to always be without being trendy or hokey. I try to stay cutting edge. I, like I said, I, I did a lot of seminars and when I would go to the seminar and I'd learn whether it was a training technique or whether it was something about how the body moved and how it needed to move and how to, how to warm it up to move that way. And, Oh, here's a tool you can purchase at the seminar. I bought all those things, anything I could get my hands on. I bought it. I came back and then I would have clients who say, Oh my God, are we at a seminar this weekend? Is that why we're using this thing and three exercises? And it was, frankly, but it's because I saw, not because it was something just new, shiny trinket, but because it was something that I thought would add value to the workout for them, you know, always pursuing the results, but also to keep them engaged. And it was fun. And I think you have to find a way to make it fun, especially if you're training three, four, five, six times a week, you know, before you know it, you have 20, 30, 40 workouts under your belt. It's hard, especially in, in a in a society where, there are so many um, images and, and things coming at you, telling you what's new, what's cool, what's different. It's easy to get distracted and it's hard to follow anything that's too monotonous. So I try to break it up without deviating from, you know, my core competency or what the body needs. I don't think you ever sacrifice what the body needs and what, what's effective for the body mm -hmm. for the end goal of the client, as well as for what I see or what I think the end goal should include um so i try to keep it fresh that's a, that's a big component of what i do without again without being hokey because there's right. i, I want to say there's a fine line but it's a very distinct line right and and they're hiring you to do that to keep it fresh keep it exciting they want to go in there and be motivated by you and switch things around and do things that they wouldn't typically do themselves so when so it comes you go, it, what, so you go to a burger place and yeah. you've had hamburger your whole life. And now here's somebody that makes it and they put a little bit of cilantro in it or they put a little <laughs> oregano. And I'm not a cook, but run with me. Uh, a little bit of oregano or, or there's like a pepper in it or something. It's still a burger. It's just got their twist on it. If it's somebody who puts like a peanut butter and jelly in it, you're like, what are you doing? Like you've, you've now deviated so far from the hamburger to make it your own and to make me remember it. But and I don't think you wrecked it because I'm sure some people say that's actually really good, but you've definitely done something that as someone who would eat a hamburger, that's just, you've gone too far. Stop, stop it. So do you stick more to the basics then? Cause I'm trying to think of it in a training style. So you're saying you don't get too crazy on the other end of the spectrum. So you stick do, more. But uh, I actually wrote this in a book. You don't have somebody like, balance a glass of water while kneeling on a ball and doing a dumbbell curl and press, but to a wide angle. Like, what are we doing? This is not a Cirque du Soleil tryout. I get that balance is, is an important component of training and has to be included. And if it's not included in some way, shape or form in your overall training program, you're probably not going to um, be as proficient a in life and B in sports. If you're a weekend warrior or like a, a pretty diligent athlete you know let's say you played tennis your whole life um you have to make sure balanced training is included or you should in my opinion um so that as you age you still have 
you know, balance, strength, cardiovascular, flexibility, mobility, stability, all those things have to be factored in. But you don't need to kneel on a stability ball, holding a glass of water and doing an angled overhead. Press. You just don't need that. That's, that. that's where I go. You're hokey. That's corny. You're trying to get us to talk about you as opposed to getting us to engage in the exercise. Okay. So I really like that you brought this up because I was going to ask you about that because a lot of there's a lot of online trainers now. And a lot of it is like, you see online, this ridiculous exercises to get attention. And it's just so far from what you really should be doing. It needs to be somewhat simple. So what do you think about that when you see that everywhere? And they could even be well-known trainers and they just do all these crazy things. Maybe because I'm older, but, but I like to think because I'm wiser and maybe the two are, are inextricably linked. I, I don't care. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't judge it. Like, you know, there's a great Bill Burr, uh, there's a great Bill Burr bit, uh, about Valentine's day. And he talks about, um, you, when you're single for so long, you get to a certain age and there's a little voice in your head that goes, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. And then another voice goes, ah, fuck it, say it. And you just, you get to a point and just say it. So I get to a point, I just don't care. Not that I'm going to say anything, but like, I don't care. I, I can't look at that and, and, and type away and say, you're a clown. Why would you do that? You're putting people at risk. I just look at it and go, cool, great physical feet. <laughs> a lot of the feats you see, and they are feats, whether they're of strength, of balance, of coordination, of hand to eye, co- of, of hand to eye coordination or dexterity, um, explosive. Some of these feats that you see, I mean, these are things that literally in the 70s and 80s, they would have been worthy of of being on a television show. And now we see them on Instagram. We're like, yeah, scroll, 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 scroll. You see certain push-up variations and um, strength things and and uh, uh, vertical leaps. Like you just look at that and you go, who are these people? How are they so superhuman? I think it's cool to look at. Is it aspirational? Uh, probably not for me. Is it inspirational? Yeah, I look at it and it makes me fired up. Anything I see physical keeps me always wanting to be physical. And I think that's probably what makes me feel so young. That and I'm extremely immature. But You think you are? I know I am, yeah. Okay, well, that's, I think that's I, a good I had thing. A, <laughs> no, no. So uh, years ago, Sylvester Stallone said to me, that's a name drop, said to me, uh, don't mistake immaturity for irresponsibility. If you're responsible and you take care of your family and you show up for work and you pay your bills and you're doing all the right things, it's okay to be immature and laugh at dumb jokes and make dumb jokes and, and, and be free about that. You don't have, I don't know why we all have to, as we get older, we're supposed to become more stoic and, uh, we're supposed to be less easy with a laugh and that I'm not that guy. I'm laughing at the dumb, funny, corny, repetitive, base, common joke. And, and I think that puts me, I think I wake up in a better mood than most people. And, yeah. I, and I would attribute, I would attribute a lot of it to that. Yeah. So I'm kind of the same way. I don't like to be too serious. I don't like when things get too like, no. just strict, I guess the word for it would be. So I appreciate that. And I like how you wake up in a better mood because you just know that whatever happens, laugh it off, go with it, whatever, you know, something good will come. But um, so getting back into the- Hold, I still get pissed. Don't get me wrong. And I still vent. I mean, I'm not like a wall puncher. I'm not that guy. Yeah. But I will, I will reach points of exasperation for sure. Mm -hmm. But I don't, uh, I don't live there. I hit it and I move on. It's like, it's like the Instagram. You see that and you go, whatever, move on, move on. Move on. I <laughs> will wrong. never, I, I would never take half a second to write a negative comment. And in fact, I probably like the post because it's almost, it's almost become um, a rote movement, right? It's like scroll, like scroll, like scroll, like, mm. because I just think if I'm following the person and I'm seeing that stuff and they've taken the time to post it, I should like it. If it's something that flies in the face of safety um, or they make some crazy claim, like everybody can drop 20 pounds if you do these two exercises four times a week. Oh my God. I'm probably, I'm probably not going to like that. But most of them I just like. And I think 
wow, you're a hell of an athlete. Good for you. I don't know that that always translates into fitness or improved body composition or improved overall health. But if that's their contribution to the landscape, who am I to say don't contribute? Yeah, no, and I agree with that. I think any type of movement, moving your body in different ways is really cool. And plus, there's so many, uh, so much information coming at us and so many different things that people do with their bodies. And then it leads into being like, oh, this, this might work or this might help with this sport. I mean, there's a lot of um, ways that people experiment with experiment with movements and it actually ends up being something that might um, help with progress. So I think it's cool to see different movements, but keeping it not, not too crazy and <laughs> not something that someone will get injured. In, but yeah, um agree yeah but but going back to your training what i was super interested in is you training actors and athletes and a regular person and kind of how that is different so do you have an example because you trained you've trained actors for movies correct movie roles yeah yeah, yeah. okay so I've you don't have in, to I, I was in la 30 years so yeah, yeah. So you don't have to give a specific oh, name. Sorry. Of I'm sorry. I was in LA 35 years and 35 I was years. training there for 30, a little more than 30 years. Yeah. That's awesome. So you don't have to give a specific name if you don't want to, but I kind of want to hear a training session of someone that is getting ready for a movie just to kind of di differentiate from someone that's just training for a regular life. It's not that different. Okay. I mean, the, 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 the main difference might be if there's something specific about their body that they're looking to enhance, because it's not always to downplay, it's not always to hide, it's not always to improve. Sometimes it's to make sure that what they have already, what they're either genetically predisposed to or what they've earned over a lifetime of fill in the blank sport or activity that, that we put that, you know, on, on like that, that gets highlighted. Um, other times it's just, different movement patterns repeated um with little variations and it's probably how consistent they are that's mm -hmm. what i would say the people who are get, getting ready for for a tour for a season for a movie um for a scene you know if you have someone who's and i've had a number of these somebody who has a sitcom and you know let's say they're doing 22 weeks or 22 to, uh, shows that year, that season. And they know that in episode, cause they've read, let's say the scripts are, and some of them, obviously they, they come out very early, uh, very late in terms of when they're going to shoot it. Right. But some of them, the first four five, six weeks, they get them in advance and they know like the arc of the story or, or certain scenes that are coming up and they go, Oh, in episode five, um, I have a shirt off scene or the woman I have a bathing suit scene or something. So there's gonna be a different consistency, a different drive, not saying that, that civilians for lack of a better term, don't have that same drive, but there's a different focus on this because this is part of their, their legacy, their body of work, their livelihood, um, you know, all that stuff is riding on it. Different from a guy who, or a girl who's going to their, 25th reunion or a, a beach vacation with the kids i mean sure you want to look your best when you when you get to the resort but if you miss a couple of days because you had to put in extra hours at work before you left you're not necessarily penalized got it so are you training these people is that an hour an hour and a half how many days a week and as well are you training these people to get ready it's, it's usually an hour um we do a five minute warm up, you know, anywhere from three to eight minute warm up, just mm -hmm. more to get them mentally in the gym and to repeat a movement pattern so that uh, the, the core temperature is elevated, the joints are used to moving, and, and I've gotten them where they're locked into uh, being in the gym versus being outside, they're off the phone, that kind of thing. And then we do the work, and then there's, uh, then I usually stretch them. I stretch mostly posterior chain because if somebody's going to stretch, it's probably going to just going to be that quad stretch that you see kids do when they run, run onto a basketball court. So I, I, I stretch hamstrings, lower back. Um, I do rotational stretches and things like that to make sure that just that their body's moving, um, right? The tin man needs oil. And uh, there, it depends on the person and what they do outside of there. Cause sometimes not, I'm not the only go-to. Sometimes they do me plus fill in the blank cardio, whether it's, you know, they take F45 classes, they take a spinning class, they do martial arts, or they have, uh, weapons training or fight training, all that you have to factor into their overall energy expenditure. 
and and their and their schedule. That's what people don't get. When someone's getting ready for a film, you think, oh, I have two months to get ready. Hold on. You think they had 60 days like just wide open? Are you kidding? They are in wardrobe meetings. They're in script. They're in rehearsal. They're in, they're working with acting coaches. They're, they are pulled in, they may be doing press. They are pulled in so many different directions by so many people. Each thing being equally important, arguably on any given day. So this is, it comes down as much. I've always said about celebrities, the hardest thing for at all, the hardest thing overall for working with them is scheduling them. And that's not because they're divas and people, oh, they're divas. They no, it's not. They have two events to go to back to back that started at 8.30 at night. They're not home till midnight. For them to do a six o'clock workout or a seven o'clock workout means by definition, they are shorting their sleep. So they've got to take later. But as it gets later, there are other things pulling at them. So, and I'm not saying, you know, all oh, poor celebrity feel bad for them, but understand that their lives are very, very full and they are under a lot of scrutiny. There's a lot of judgment. And again, it's not poor them, but, but it's not as easy as people think. And that's why you see so few really rise above. That's why you see so many tap out early. That's why you see a, a lot of them implode. And there's just a lot of, things pulling at them so if they can find ways to commit and get their fitness on lock and prioritize that and that becomes a cornerstone of their of their lives and their and their careers they're i think better set up for longevity in the field how do you even schedule for that if you have a client like a client that needs to train for something and they can only do this this specific time how I do, do you fit all, these people I in? do i do all my own oh you're gonna like this i'm gonna give you this oh i like that <laughs> What's actually in it? Ice water. Oh my God. <laughs> All right. Bio. Not as hardcore bio. as I thought. I thought you were going to say black coffee at least. No, I've never had coffee. That's the bio steel in that. Oh my um, gosh. Uh, your question. How do you fit these people in? With they, they need a specific I, time or can't do all, every time. You, 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 when you take them on, you prioritize, what are they thinking? Okay. Well, I'm an early morning person. And you go, okay, what's early morning? Because someone's definition of early morning is mm-hmm. not someone else's definition of early morning. Um, I used to train a rock star, a big time rock star. And he once called me and he said, hey, I'm having trouble with this. He was on the road and he said, you know, I- I'm doing the workouts you sent. I- I'm still staying with it. But I- I've been hearing all this stuff about not eating after eight o'clock. He goes, I don't go on stage till 11. And I go, no, 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 that's not for you. What it really means is don't eat two to three hours before bedtime. That's really what that means. So you have to learn what someone's definition of morning or night or whatever mm-hmm. is. Um, and then you see where you can fit it in your schedule. And then you make sure that the people you're training on a regular basis versus those you're training for a specific project uh, are understanding and you have to set that tone you don't just take your person who's been with you uh, for you know Monday was a Friday 9 a.m for five years and go hey I got a movie to 10 I got somebody who's doing a movie you're going to create a lot of ill will and that's going to be ultimately bad press and I don't mean in the press I mean hmm. they're going to be a bigger mouthpiece than any tv show or newspaper could ever be for you so you have to be careful with that and you say I, I never kept people on uh regular times i just because in in at least in my experience in la in in where i was um everyone's schedule is kind of in flux and someone who says they want monday wednesday friday at nine you know one day they go hey i have to take my kid to school so i have to come at 10 and you go i just moved everybody for you so what i find is and you can't like, look, they're the customer. They're always right. Period. You're in a service industry. You have to serve period. Those are two hard truths that I don't think a lot of trainers factor in and being your own boss and making your own money. And, and you start to think that you're running the show. And in fact, you're not, and you shouldn't be the clients are, and you have to acknowledge that and do your best to accommodate. So the best way to do that is manage expectations. If someone says, I need Monday, Wednesday, Friday, nine. I go, I have someone then. I could probably do Tuesday, Thursday, nine, and I could find another day that might be eight or 10. Could that work? And you find out 
there's some give and take in a lot of people and some people there's zero give and take and that's fine too, but those probably aren't the right people for me and you have to decide if they're the right ones for you. Yeah, and every client wants to feel like they're the most important because they're paying you for that. So it's And they tough. are, and, and in fact they are, mm -hmm. but you can't cannibalize another existing relationship or even another burgeoning relationship just because they need it that day. You do your best and you hope everybody's flexible. And when you get, and, and I've had people that will absolutely not move a time. I've had people who don't have a regular job who want a certain time and, and you get it as close to that time as you can for them. And then I had somebody who needed that time for a specific project and the other person wouldn't budge. And then that person all of a sudden needs to make a change and you go, so you won't move for anybody, but you want everyone to move for you. That's not really, mm -hmm. you know, playing nicely in the sandbox as I see it. So did you have trainers under you that if you couldn't do it, you would give it to them type of thing? I never, I never had trainers under me. I always had a trainer side by side. Um, ah. and, I, and I, and I look at it like that. Um, we didn't have a hierarchy in the gym and I, I, you know, I don't have like, there are very few policies that we had. It's more of a, you do you, I do me. Here's what I found. If I'm the older guy in the room and I've done this longer, it might behoove you to hear what I've done, whether you think it's all wrong or not. It's, it's, I believe it's good in any field to know what came before you um, and to see if you can improve upon it, which you probably can. But they work side by side with me. And I try to say the same thing. I'd say, be careful locking people in you know, this guy at eight, this guy nine, this guy 10, this guy 11, that looks great on paper. And in your mind, you're already calculating how you're going to plan the workouts, how much money you're going to earn, what time you're going to start, what time you're going to be done. But one person tweaks that and you're at the mercy. And that's truly a house of cards. I see. So when it comes to training these people, cause I want to touch on what you said with the rock star, you send them workouts. How do you go about structuring your training programs? Because it sounds to me like it's not really just session by session. You're texting them, you're sending them workouts on the road. So it becomes this whole coaching process rather than just a single session. So how do you structure that for a specific client? Um, you, you work backwards from any uh, important standout dates that they have, whether this is day they shoot this is the day they leave to go on tour this is the day they're on vacation this is the shirt listing whatever it is you work backwards from that then you make sure you know and understand what else they have in their lives do they do pilates on their off days do they take a cardio class do they hike every single day how demanding is it you want to make sure that you're getting the most out of them not overtax them to the point of no return the last thing you want look it's easy to cripple somebody and break them in a workout that's that's not that's not to me the sign of a good trainer um the goal to me is to leave them i had uh, a tennis player i trained for a lot of years uh one of the best guys ever and just a great guy and he used to say he loved leaving sitting in his car and having to just sit for like 10 minutes to come down from the workout that's a bit extreme but so was he which i love um but to me, that's kind of a larger picture of what you really want. I want people to leave there and feel like, wow, <laughs> okay, on with my day. I don't want someone to be curled up in the fetal position, dry heaving and going, great workout. That's not a great workout. That's not the sign of success, in my opinion. Yeah, you have to balance it. Like I've definitely had days where I train my clients and it's a really intense day, but if they're coming back the second, the next day after that, we make sure it's a little bit low intensity, lower intensity. Well, right. So, well, but also not just if they're coming back to you, what else do they have in their life? Are they the leaving the gym and going on a field trip with their kid at school? And they've got to, you know, watch out for 37 year olds. Cause now you've done every one of those kids a disservice by, by breaking you know, the, the, the hall monitor. So you got to make sure that what you're doing fits in their day. It's different with athletes, right? It's, especially it's different with athletes in the off season there. You have a little more latitude to go harder and to, and to push and that kind of thing, because they're younger, they are athletes, a very different breed. Um, they have the time to recover and they're not, you, there's usually not something else on deck immediately following that some of them though 
they're doing beach workouts, they're doing pool workouts, they're doing sports specific workouts, they're doing XYZ recovery protocol, whether it's they're going cryo, they're going massage, or they're doing dry needling. And then where do they fit the workout in? Because it's not just like they do the workout and then they sit back and go, how does my body feel? What's happening? I want to I want to experience it. They go on and on and on. So what you do has to fit in with the whole thing. So it's worth it's worth asking the questions to make sure everybody's on the same page. Yeah. It can't be too taxing on their body. I agree with that. Cause working out is for a lifetime. It's not just for the specific deadline for most people. So you want to make sure they feel good. They're not dealing with an injury or it puts yeah. them out for six months to a year. I don't know. So right. yeah, I well, agree with if you. you. Also, also, if you injure an athlete, uh, your phone's going to ring. That's, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's not you that injures them, you know, unless God forbid you, you literally drop a weight on them, but if you push them to the point where something goes, look, Achilles injuries are, are freak. And sometimes that happens to the best trained guys and they're just on the court and they turn and it pops. Okay. But barring that, if you're having them do crazy hokey stuff in a, in a fatigued state, you know, loaded death jumps and the guy's ankle rolls, that's, that's just bad programming. And that's you as the trainer trying to be, it's like a weird form of dominance. I don't know, conscious or subconscious. Mm. And you just look at that. You're like, you don't have to do that. You don't have to, you don't have to do that. That's probably not the right movement to program for that guy or girl. Has that ever happened to you where someone gets injured during and you're like, Oh shit. <laughs> no, I had a, I had a quarterback years ago. Uh, do something with his back. We were doing landmine up uh, like, like, like a clean to a, twisting press uh. and he and he said he felt his back uh i had somebody once doing plyo jumps an actor and i said we're good and i called it and we had only done five but i'm big on like explosive movements in the five six range and he goes no no i got more of me i go we're good and this is back when i had uh when i had actual plyo boxes like the metal mm -hmm. ones uh now i have a thing <laughs> called the Ro i had the thing called the ronin if you don't know what that is you should definitely look into it you cannot get hurt i mean way less likely to get hurt on a Ronin for um, made by Titan for, for plow jumps. But I had this guy and he goes, no, no, I got more in me. And he jumped and he whacked his shin on it and it split it right in half. Oof. I ha in fairness, I did say stop, but I didn't physically get in the way and, you know, stop him. So I don't know. I don't, I knock on wood. I haven't had many injuries in the gym. I've had, I had an actress doing deadlifts and she was blasting through the sets and I go, slow it down, pump the brakes, easy, easy. She goes, I got to get through this. I got somebody to go through. And she boom, 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 and hurt her back. Is that on me? Um, I did try to slow it. I did say you're rushing this. You're trying mm. to check boxes versus like getting through this. But, you know, it, it is on your watch. So you do have to look back and, and see what part you played in it. I do believe that you have to take that responsibility. Yeah. And I mean, also shit happens if you're training day in and day out. I mean, some days you think you can do more than you can the box jump thing. I mean, that's even happened to me when I've done it like every single day when I was running track and I split my shin open, it was like something so stupid. So yeah. but it's I don't hard even to count explain. that, but, but it's hard to get on a phone call with an agent oh. or a coach and go shit happens. Oh like yeah. 100%. That's a tough, that's, that's, that's Hold not going to, they're not going to go, you know what? You're absolutely right. Any <laughs> yeah, shit bad. happens. <laughs> I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to have interrupted your day. You're not, that's not going to happen. It's true. They put it all on you and they're paying you to make sure that they're safe and, and confident with everything they do. So I understand that. And moving actually into like a business point of view, when you were talking earlier about, um, if someone asked you how much they charge for your session, you said, I'll get back to you. I'm sure back then it's very different than how it is now because you're more experienced. You have a lot under your belt. So how do you go about pricing yourself out for your training sessions? Whatever our price is, I say we, I use the, the collective pronoun because I, I, whoever I'm working with side by side, as I said, it has to be, we have to be the same price. And someone says, yeah, but you're the draw. And I go, yeah, but they're staying for you. And they go, but, but you're known, but you're older. And I go, yeah, but they're coming back for you. We have to be the same. Also, because if you cover someone for me when I'm gone and you charge more, they might resent it. If you charge less, they might think, well, I'm paying less. So it's probably not going to be as good. And they might go in predisposed to not like it. Or they might think, 
that was just as good and it was less. I'm not training with Gunner anymore. So just easier to keep it apples to apples. Um, the pricing, I, I don't know. I, I don't think I raised my rates in the last 10 years. I just, I'm, I'm not a great businessman. I, I like to think I'm a decent trainer, a decent husband, a decent father and a decent brother and son. And I'll leave it at that. Um, I, I just, I, I think training has always been our loss leader and you develop ancillary revenue streams and, and you find other ways within the industry to make ends meet. You don't just, you don't just, gouge the client for more and more and more mm -hmm. and more. And I've heard of some trainers charging fees that made me go, what? They charge how much? That's more than I pay my lawyer. Like that's, oh, I mean. For an hourly rate? Oh yeah. I've heard of some rates that, that literally made me sit down and I. What, like 400? Yeah. Stuff like that. And they go, you could get that. You could, you could command that. I go, I would never, I would never, I just think. I don't know. I just think there's a cutoff. And then I have people say, yeah, but you know, in, in the seventies cars were going for five grand, six grand, eight grand. And, and now you, you're seeing cars, $150,000, two and a half, you know, get up into the luxury car models. You're paying crazy numbers for cars. That's hard for some people to swallow when it's a service that's repeated day in or, or two, three, four, five times a week. All of a sudden that number becomes substantial and i think I, I just i don't see it i don't think the service deserves that much and i can have trainers get angry at me all they want i want to go i'm sorry you're a trainer like that just, i get that there are costs in life and there's a, a you know cost of living index and i get that it goes up and i get in place i understand these things but i think there are certain services that that have to have a ceiling and, and maybe i'm way below the ceiling maybe i'm close to this i don't know but I, I look at some of those numbers and think you know it's a it, it, there's a cutoff like if i said to you you know what would you pay for a hamburger you know you could pay <laughs> would you pay six dollars would you pay 16 would you pay 26 would you pay 50 you know you might say where is it how big is it what does it come with what's the event I get it, but there is a number that is just a rock hard no. I love all these burger analogies. <laughs> it's very relatable. <laughs> maybe, maybe I, I know what I'm for. Maybe you're hungry. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, but you look at that and, and you, you know, there is a number that's a cutoff unless it's a one time thing. And then you go, mm -hmm. where was I? I was in some restaurant in LA and they had shots of something and, and they had one shot that was $100. And the kid I was with said, we should get that. And I go, why? Like, what could possibly even? He goes, I don't know, but I'm curious. And I said, I'm not $100 curious for that. I'm just not that curious. So maybe someone, there's a curiosity factor. What could it be at that number? But then you're not talking about return business. You're talking about like, just, that's just, to me, we, we, we've fallen right back into the hokey realm. Okay. So your hourly, well, what do you charge per hour? If you're oh, allowed to say, no, there's no chance I'm putting that out here. All right, Hell fine. No. So, so, okay. So when someone signs up, are you charging, are you doing hourly rates? Or are you doing a program for them? No, we like do six hourly. weeks, eight we, weeks. We always do hourly and it's always been that way. And, and I just think that's, that's very clean. I don't do the 24 hour cancellation. You pay rate. I say, just call me by nine or text me by nine the night before, because I mean, I should be in bed by nine, but let's face it, I'm not. So that gives me a little time to fill the hour. I don't think you gouge people. The way our lives work, things come up. Um, you know, something could very well have come up for you. Actor, athlete, mm -hmm. parent, professional, um, stay-at-home parent, whatever you are, things do happen. It's a 24-hour world, and and I can't you know, again, penalize you for that. I just think that's, I think that's wrong. I think as a trainer, you, you can't do that. You yeah. Can't. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. And, and going into, so I know the pandemic changed a lot with like the online training. I personally don't think you can ever get rid of the in-person training, but I know that you have an app, correct? Do you have an app? So out? I, I have an app that, uh, I did not do the app. I, I wrote huh. all the programming for it. I shot all the videos for it. I didn't put the app together. Um, 
I, I don't service it. I, that, it's just not my world. I'm not, a, like I told you, I was so excited to get on the Zoom. I, I was so proud of myself for doing it. I'm just not <laughs> techie like that. So the okay. app, I'm not, I, I think apps are, I think I'm not going to say it's the way of the future. Like it's the only thing, but I definitely think they're here to stay. And I think they're great for a lot of people. I think some people, they're just never going to be app people ever. They're never going to train like that. Some people are never going to train in their homes. Some people are never going to train in gyms. Some people are going to train with a trainer. Some people are never going to go uh, to a big box gym. They're, 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 you know, there are 8 billion people on the planet. There's enough, mm -hmm. there are enough ways to get it done that you can find what works for you and you may find you're a class person for a while and then uh, you're over it or something happens in the class you're like ew i don't want to go back to that i need one-on-one -on -one. i need one-on-one -on -one at home i need one-on-one -on -one at somebody else's place i need small group you're going to find your way so again why would i sit around and slam anything that anybody else is doing if you're doing it good for you and i hope it keeps working so for a trainer, do you think it's important to have the online plus the in-person rather than just one or the other? It's probably from a business standpoint, a good move. And I know people who have been in the field um, nowhere near as long as I have. I know people who, who are, are new in every way to it, who are financially crushing me because of their online presence. And I have, and I don't have that. So again, it's probably a really good thing. That's not my world. So I can't speak to it like, Oh, you got to do this. I don't know. I think, I think you probably should, but I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't sit there as the person who doesn't exercise and say, you ought to get to the gym. I'm not that guy. So I'm, I'm not the tech guy. So I can't tell you, you should be, but you probably should. Yeah. And I also think it's very hard to focus on both. I think it's easy to, easier to focus on one or the other because it's two completely separate worlds and programming and or programs and everything, how you put it out there. So um, I also I, think, uh, but I also think from what I've heard, some of those people are doing like cookie cutter things. And some of the people know that there is a program that they're going to receive, that it's the same program that if their neighbor ordered it, they would receive. There are others who, who say that it's a, a more uh, personalized approach. I don't know how you do that. I don't know how if you get, you know, a thousand people signing up, a hundred people signing up. It's all I can do to program, you know, uh, I'm going to open this gym here in Nashville in probably a week or so, um, eight, 10, 12 people a day to prep those workouts thoroughly, um, conscientiously the night before and fit those in the overall programming scheme for someone and, and not be completely wiped out. So if you're doing an online component and, and you are truly individualizing those, that seems to me like an awful lot of time. Again, though, those people may not be training in the gym, so they may not have their hours spoken for the next day um, the way I did. Yeah, I mean, the only way I've seen it done with like thousands of clients online is hiring those coaches next to you <laughs> and teaching them how to kind of program it for them to make it more individual. But I just don't know how I see what you're saying. But that's not authentic. I mean, to me, then yeah. I can't say to you that I wrote your programs. If I handed that, if I, if I delegated that to someone and they, you know, plug and play gunner's way, no, you didn't, you can't, you don't know my way. You don't know my way. You might see it and understand it in broad strokes, but, but there's going to be something you do or something you don't do that automatically would it would be identifiable to, to the to the to the trained eye that that's not my program and I don't want to do that I don't want to be I want to put my head on the pillow and know I wasn't disingenuous that's just me though so what do you think is the best way then to scale your a training business without having this influx of people online without having a ton of group classes I want to hear your advice I don't know and okay. I'll tell you something I took a job uh, I took the job with F45 about a year ago as chief of athletics. And the reason I took it was because uh, someone brought me to a class and I thought the word, and this is not a plug you asked, I'm answering. Okay. Someone took me to an F45 class and it was a hybrid class. So it was uh, strength slash cardio or cardio slash strength, however you look at it. And I came out of the class on a, on a Thanksgiving morning, a number of years ago. And I go, that's an unbelievable workout. This, they've scaled me. That training, the way they're training in F45 classes is as close to the way I train people, which I find 
efficient, which I mean, client retention, percentage of canceled workouts all speak to the fact that the way I'm doing something is, is working on some level. And I, and I walked out of that class and I go, that was great. I would take this every day. I know people who train with me who would probably be better off taking, taking that than training with me. So, wow. so they, and, and I joked about it. I go, they scaled me and I couldn't scale me. So I don't know how to scale it. And I still don't. Okay. Um, but I got involved with that 45 because I wanted to be part of that. I wanted to be part of scaling something that I could scale. I did an infomercial in the early 2000s that did very well. Um, and I was able to control all of the programming. I wrote all the workouts. And then Guffy Renker distributed it, marketed it, produced it, handled returns, complaints. I hope there were no complaints. Uh, and, I haven't heard and any. I, yeah, I don't do that. So I need somebody to do that. I don't know how to scale it. So I look at F45. The, clearly, they didn't start out trying to scale me. They saw what I saw in fitness as an efficient way. Obviously, probably not the best way if you're looking for just straight hypertrophy. But if you're looking for overall fitness, changing body composition, improving all of your biomarkers, all of your, your, your you know, checking all your wellness boxes, I think what F45 does is unbelievable. And it's, again, not a plug. That's what I think. That's why I started taking the classes. That's why I spoke to them about working there. And I started working there. Yeah. Okay. So you partnered with a already established. No, no, no. they hired me, okay. uh, chief of athletics. So mm -hmm. I, I, I look, I work on programming. I work on, uh, we have a, we have a call today about training the trainers. You want to mm, make sure that the, the training staff has a certain bedside manner that there's a, that there's a welcome, there's a reception, there's a, a way to interact there's a system to it all and i mean that's that's for another podcast or yeah. another book or whatever but the way overall it's not you're not as a trainer when you do this for a career not for a job big difference there's so much more than just the workout and executing the workout and, and you know uh sets and reps and like counting on your fingers and blah. there are so many things that go into that experience and i think the experience start starts when the person pulls up and it finishes when they pull out and are your bathrooms clean is the equipment clean are you eating do you smell do you, i mean i could go down the list there are a hundred and sometimes you talk to trainers about this, they look at you like what are you talking about and all i think is we're just different we're, do, we're approaching this differently my way is not right my way is right for me mm -hmm. and if you're succeeding then your way is clearly right from you for you but if you're struggling and you're talking to me and i'm telling you what i see that i think you should tweak and you're getting defensive, why we don't need to have this conversation. Like, no problem. Carry on. Keep going. Mm -hmm. I totally it, agree. It, yeah. Wow. Okay. So, and I like F45, by the way. I've taken a few classes. The ones that Great. I took were, I actually wanted more heavy lifting. That was my only critique. I wanted a few more heavier things. But other than that, I mean, I love the high intensity and functional stuff. And Did you take strength days or did you take hybrid days? I, maybe I did a hybrid. It might have yeah. been hybrid then. Are there heavier stuff in the strength? Yeah. Some okay. of the strength days are pretty intense. Like you leave with like, with the legitimate, I mean, I don't know if you ever went more like the bodybuilding route, but you leave yeah. pumped. You go, wow, I really feel like I lifted weights today. And I love that feeling, yeah. but I know that I need the hybrid stuff and left to my own devices. I would probably skew that way, but I like the feeling of the hybrid classes. I love the cardio days if I just want to flush and I may do a cardio day and then go lift on my own or I may do a cardio day and then go lift the next day. Um, I find the, the programming overall, um, the stuff that predated me to be so well thought out that it's just, it's, um, it's just great. I mean, they, they scaled what I could never scale. And you feel good training that way, right? Long-term, like you don't feel like you have any stiffness injuries nothing like that okay no but i train every day i never miss i stretch every day and some people yeah you know, i had one kid who say no intensity when you train i go okay maybe <laughs> but i went every day this month and you didn't so it's it's not how much intensity do i need what are my end goals mm -hmm. I, and you are more ready to to get after it yeah, it could be their fear of the activity because of their something previous that happened with their movement or, you know, you never know. 
Right. It could be a mixture of the two. So what is next for you? I'm opening this gym here in Nashville, Cool. Um, which we got some property. So there'll be an outdoor component to it. Uh, it'll be fun. It's going to be good. And, and I've wanted to do it for a long time in, in this bigger way. A um, couple of TV projects in the work. Let's see what goes. That's a, that's a funny one. Uh, that's, those are, those are tough waters. You're to excited about it, aren't you? I can tell. I'm so excited about yeah. it because it's like I wake up excited because the game's never over. As long as I keep showing up, the game is never over. That's cool. It's literally like every time you show up, the clock resets. Energy. The clock resets. Yeah, oh, yeah. Exactly. Anything, right? If, you know, if somebody says, I want to come at this time, I've also made a couple of, uh, I wouldn't say they're hard and fast rules, but a couple of concessions with my wife and kids that, Part of the reason to move was so that I wasn't just living at the gym all day, every day. So uh, the early, early mornings, I may be, I may be doing school runs. The, er, the mid afternoons, I may be doing school pickups. I don't know. Um, but when someone reaches out to me and they want to come train, I'm going to do my best to get them in. Yeah. You also want to make sure it's for the right reasons and they're there for the right reasons. I put so much into the prep of the workout and the experience for the person. You don't want someone who's not there that's how people go. How do you decide who you train? I just want them to be as into it as I am. Mm -hmm. and, and I can't be more into your workout than you are. Right. You got, yeah, it's I, gotta be a balance. So this gym is I not for the public. Oh, it's a private training gym. It's the same way my gym was in LA. Got I it. just can't, I can't be more excited for you to come work out than you are for you to come work out. That's a, that's an unnatural. Balance. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. me personally, I'm always excited for the workout. Right. Same. <laughs> So when is this gym opening? Probably September 1st. Oh, soon. Depending, depending on permits and contractors and plumbing and blah, blah, blah. Could be September 15th, but it shouldn't be later than that. Cool. So in the next few weeks. Yes. That's awesome. Well, congratulations. That's super exciting. Thank you. Well, where can they find you if they want to find your website, your Instagram, all that um, stuff? The website is gunnerpeterson.com. I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know if websites are still a thing, but I have one. Um, and Instagram is Gunner Fitness. So cool. G U N N A R, easy to find. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for sitting down with me. And this is the Annie Tunes podcast. Thank you very much for having me on. I'm